Philippians chapter 4. If you're a bit surprised that it's not the book of Psalms, we are going to take a, a one-week break from the book of Psalms. If you remember last week, we studied Psalm 16, which has this wonderful verse from David. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. We wanted to take an entire message and, and basically expand a bit on that theme, draw out some of what Paul says about our calling as church members, our calling as Christians to the body of Christ. And so therefore, we're going to look at the, the great book on the church in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians. Uh, but before we jump into the message, I, I want to thank you for your prayers this last week. Um, we were able to attend the Sovereign Grace Pastors Conference, and uh, if you're new with us, we uh, are a part of a family of churches really around the world at this point um, that just comes together for a shared statement of faith, shared doctrine. We combine uh, resources we give uh, to this family of churches for the support and care of pastors and for the advancement of the mission. And, and this week was really an example of why we give regularly and faithfully to this family of churches, because we were able to come and be refreshed and be envisioned, be inspired, and then see our fellow pastors around the world doing that. I also wanted to give you a, a little bit of a highlight. It was, it was really deeply soul-refreshing to hear reports of all that the Lord is allowing us to do as a family of churches around the world, uh, far more, far more uh, than we could do just individually as a church. But our, our giving and our service and our support is having an effect in Nepal, where our, our very own team is going to be heading out uh, in just a short period of time to serve a man there named Barnabas. Uh, we are able to serve uh, ch- churches and, and pastors in, in a country that we can't even uh, talk about because it's a closed location and there has to be a certain level of protection of their identity. We're able to serve. There was, we heard about a, a pastor's conference uh, that is taking place in the Philippines, a number of Philippine pastors who desire to be a part of our family of churches and are walking through our seven shared values. Uh, we, we talk to those who are leading a pastor's conference annually now in Mexico and serving uh, hundreds of pastors from around the country there. I talked to a friend of mine who uh, is, is in the process of planting a church in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, it, it just was, it was remarkable. At one point, we were singing there, and behind us uh, was the gentleman who was the founding pastor of the Ark Church in Germany. And my wife was commenting that to listen to him exclaim over the messages in German uh, was just delightful. It was a little little piece of heaven uh, to hear him say in German uh, different points that he was excited about at various messages. So I just wanted to, to let you know what, what a joy it is that our... Our existence as a church and, and our meager contribution to this family of churches is having a, a major, major effect around the world. Uh, church plants are going forward. The nations um, are being reached. Uh, obviously, Sovereign Grace is not the only uh, group of churches that's doing this, but, but we are playing a part in the mission of the gospel going around the world. If, if, if you'd like more updates or you'd like to hear, I can't possibly list all of the countries, all of the exciting things that are happening, but it was a joy uh, to represent you and also to receive uh, fresh grace and encouragement uh, from the men who lead Sovereign Grace. Their heart is to encourage and refresh pastors, ultimately because uh, they want those pastors to encourage churches. So uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, It really was a joy to go this week and represent you and and also to be refreshed uh, by this time as well. Well, if you would look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to read portions of the opening half of this chapter, but really we're going to zero in on verses 15 and 16. And even among those verses, we're going to look at just one praise in particular this morning with greater emphasis. But the context here is just so rich and so valuable that I thought it'd be helpful for us to kind of get a flavor of this chapter as we dive in. Let's, let's begin reading in verse 1. I therefore... Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, even as we just sang this morning. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And here we come to our verses this morning. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Well, he was called the man with the golden arm, not because of his football ability. His real name is James Harrison, a native of Australia. In the 1950s, he had a major chest operation at the age of 14, and he received 13 units of blood. After the successful operation, his father told him that certainly the blood had helped save his life, and he vowed when he was old enough to donate blood to help others, which he began to do immediately After turning 18, he continued donating for 63 years, faithfully every other week. In this time, doctors in Australia were combating a disease called hemolytic disease. It was very dangerous for babies in utero, and they found that a particular antibody in James's blood was needed and helpful to combat this disease. At one point, 17% of pregnant women in Australia uh, faced this dilemma. One estimate surmised that in light of the amount of blood he's donated and his particular antibody that helps with the creation of a cure for this disease, over the course of his lifetime, James had helped 2.4 million babies, including one of his own grandchildren. Remarkable. Let me ask a question. If you knew that your blood could be used to save lives, would you give? I think we would. I think you would. I think I would. If you knew, if you knew ahead of time that this was a unique and powerful and profound calling, would you give? I I think you would. I think I would if you knew this kind of impact could be had little by little over the years. And Actually, all of us do know, because we've been told, that we have a similarly unique opportunity and responsibility. James Harrison received and he gave. He received from others and he gave of himself. And I think that is precisely what is in view when Paul talks about the church. That the way God has designed the church, there is to be this life given and life given on to others. Life received and life given. That there is this calling that Christians have to build up the body of Christ of which they are a part. As Paul concludes the paragraph, the goal of this would be that the body would grow so that it builds itself up in love. There's something extraordinary happening here in chapter 4. 
Paul, if you know the book of Ephesians, and we did a whole series on it, if you want to look at our website, uh, in chapter 4, he is turning the corner from talking about the doctrine of the church and what Christ did to save people from their sin and to bring them together, that the church is this new temple, a dwelling place for God. And then he turns the corner and says, now, how are you, church member, to respond to this glory? Well, you have a task. You are to receive and you are to give. There is a, a life-giving transfer, transfusion that is to take place in the ongoing life of the church. God has so designed the church that the church builds itself up in love, that God's design for the church takes place through the investment of church members. It's a remarkable thing. In light of the power of God, the grace of God, the supremacy of God, and what is at stake, namely the exaltation of Jesus Christ as the head of all things, the fact that this great plan is expressed through the giving and receiving of one body part to another, it is an extraordinarily profound privilege. Now, I want to give us two categories in these verses, 15 and 16, two, two themes that I think help us to understand the passage. We'll walk through that, and then I want to make some application for our life as a church. Let's look down here. Again, Paul says in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love. So I want to summarize this first theme, the goal of growth. The goal of growth, point number one. Paul has been talking about the danger to Christians of being tossed back and forth in different doctrine and in deceitful false teachers who would try to pull people away from Christ. And in 13, he's been talking about how the goal of our growth is ultimately to measure up to the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So nothing short of rightly honoring Jesus as our head is appropriate growth. And then he says, what we are not to do is to be those tossed around by false doctrines. Rather, here's what we are to do. Rather, he says, so it's a contrast from the, the vulnerable Christian. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. And you notice again in verse 16, the word grow takes place again. So there isn't in Ephesians 4 this idea that the church is called to grow. God's goal for the church is not arrival, it is growth. It is not plateau, it is growth. It is not sufficiency, it is growth. It is not maintenance, it is growth. And growth that is not sufficient until we can rightly say that we are appropriately honoring him who is our head. In other words, growth doesn't stop until we're glorified and in heaven. Uh, to use a silly example, uh, you, you, we've all said to that teenage boy who is growing rapidly in certain years, and we've looked at his feet and said, uh, well, I, you're going to grow into those feet someday. Well, in a, in a similar way, Paul is saying, look, you, you have a head and authority who, who, who is the source of your life, and you need to understand, you, you are supposed to reflect rightly upon that head. Currently, the, the body is in its infant stage. The head is full grown. You're supposed to grow into what it means to be the body of Christ. Your spiritual maturity is intended by God to accurately reflect that you are the body of Christ Jesus. That's the goal of your growth, to reflect honorably on Jesus Christ. There's a manner in which this growth takes place. Notice this in verse 15. Instead of being deceived, we are to speak the truth in love. So the manner of our growth, what's taking place as we grow, is that we are speaking the truth. And I think for Paul, truth always has a, a center point on the person and work of Jesus and all that he accomplished, the summation of God's purposes in Christ. To speak the truth in Paul is to speak the gospel and all of its implications. It's to accurately represent God, and we are to do this to one another. So let's put this together. What's the goal of our growth? It takes place as the church speaks the truth about Christ in love to one another, 
and the, the arrival of our growth has not taken place until we can accurately reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. Rather, not deceived, not vulnerable to every wind of doctrine, rather, we are speaking the truth in love, and here's our goal, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. That is our goal. That is our responsibility. That is our privilege. We are not called to arrive and plateau. We are called to grow. Let me impress this on us, brothers and sisters. If our tendency is to assume that our Christian maturity has reached a sufficiency, a sufficient platform, we do not yet see the glory of our head. If our normal tendency as Christians is to assume we have arrived in knowledge and maturity and godliness and that little growth is still necessary before us, we are not fully appreciating the honor of being the body of Christ. We are not merely a religious body. We are not a body of greater morality than our neighbors. We are not a body of religious conservatism. We are a body of Christ designed to reflect his glory. The body should accurately portray the glory of the head. And if that is not yet happening, we still have growing to do. Grow up into him who is the head. It is this magnificent privilege. Listen, Christian, you are called to be a part of reflecting glory on Jesus Christ. You, you cannot accept a lesser calling for yourself. You cannot accept a better than average calling for yourself. You cannot accept a reasonable maturity calling for yourself. No, you are called to be the body of Christ. No lesser glory is acceptable to a Christian. We are called to grow. The Lord has called us to grow. Now, if we are reasonably humble, that should immediately sober us and humble us, shouldn't it? How many of you feel as though your maturity accurately reflects the measure of the stature of the Son of God? Do, do, we, do we feel the, the weight of that? We, we, we would all rightly so chuckle. And yet we need to feel that is precisely our calling. Imagine if you were a lighthouse keeper. That when you went to the lighthouse keeper, you said, your calling is to shine this light in such a way that ships do not sink. And let's imagine if the lighthouse keeper, aware of his own limitation, began to chuckle, as we would rightly, and say, I can't, I can't do that. You would say, well, yes, but, but that is your job. That is your calling. You are the lighthouse keeper. I can't. I, I mean, have you seen my light? I, I, I flicker. I can't, I, can't, I can't do this. What Paul was trying to impress on them, we must feel and not allow the, the kind of acceptance of mediocrity that creeps into our souls to lessen our responsibility. Yes, you are called. You, Christian, you are called to be a part of the body of Christ that doesn't stop growing until it reflects his glory. It says right here in God's word, you are not called to anything less. I am not called to anything less than this. And therefore, it should create a desperation in our souls. How, how can this take place? How can we do this? How can we fulfill our calling? How can we grow in this way? How can we do this? Well, thankfully, Paul doesn't stop at the goal. He moves to the second section, the cause of our growth. The goal of our growth, point one, then the cause of our growth. Notice he says, rather, we are not those tossed about by cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes, whether of our own hearts or of false teachers. Rather, we are speaking the truth, especially about Christ. In love, we are growing up. And then here he gets into the cause. Notice the grammar of this next verse. I want to urge you to not turn off your, your, your grammar brain right now. Okay? Grammar is, is the source of theology in the New Testament. All right? So look down there, look at your Bibles and notice this. Notice this. How does the church grow? 
See if you can answer that question by looking at your Bibles. How do we do this, Paul? How do we fulfill this calling, Paul? How does it grow? Notice, from whom, who's that referring to? Christ. From whom, so Christ is the source, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now let's break down. When I was in school, we did, you know, sentence analysis. Did you ever do that in school? Sentence. You have to break down the subjects and the verbs and the modifiers and so forth. So let's just do this real quick. All right, you can do this with me. This is understanding your Bible. Notice this. Notice how this sentence works. It starts with Christ. So whatever happens after this, it flows from him. From whom? From whom indicates that Christ is the source of of whatever cause of growth is about to take place. From whom? From Christ. And notice this. The whole body, pause, and there's a lot of modifiers for body. How does the body work? Well, it's joined and held together, and every joint in which it is equipped is working as each part works properly. All of that describes how the body is supposed to work. But the center of the sentence is this. From Christ, the whole body makes the body grow. Do you see that in your Bible? Look, look at the grammar there in your text. From Christ, the whole body, all descriptions of the body, so on and so forth, makes the body grow. So here's how we summarize this. What is the cause of our growth? Well, Christ is the source and the body is the means. Christ is the source and the body is the means. And here's what's remarkable. We are called to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Son of God, the head of all creation, God's center point in all of his purposes in human history. We are called to measure up to that glory. And obviously, the source of our growth comes from him. It is his power and the sending of his spirit that makes any good thing possible in the church. But the means of that growth, the immediate cause of growth is who? The body. We can run this backwards. If the body does not do its work to help the body grow, the church will never attain to the glory God has given it to attain. If the church does not help the church grow as God designed it to do, then the church will never attain to the glory that God intended it to attain. So the source, obviously, and all ultimate glory for power belongs to the Lord. A pipe doesn't get any glory for the water itself. Jesus is the source. He is the fountain. He is the power generator. And yet, there is something for wires and pipes to do. And God doesn't change his mind. Since Paul wrote these words, they are just as true right now in Redemption Hill Church as they were in the church in Ephesus. These people weren't all that different from us. They didn't have cars, but they had, you know, other means of transportation. They didn't eat cheeseburgers, but they had other forms of food. They woke up, they ate, they worked, they went to sleep. They weren't all that different from us. They gathered together in rooms and heard teaching from the Bible. They had struggles, they had difficulties, they had conflicts, they had temptations. Worldliness abounded around them. They had to walk past the temple of Artemis every couple of days. Just like we have to walk past the billboards of ungodliness every couple of days. They weren't all that different from us. And Paul says to them, the body makes the body grow. From Christ, he's the source, he's the power. It's through union with him that anything good we do takes place. But the body makes the body grow. In other words, the body and any part in it can't grow without the body. And every part is supposed to help the body grow. Do you see the grammar of this and how it, it drives this responsibility, this privilege, this calling? Whatever the sense of impossibility of this calling, of measuring up to the stature of the glory of Jesus is, here is the, the means that God has given. It's you. It is you. 
It is you, 14-year-old Christian. It is you, 74-year-old Christian. It is you, mother of young children. It is you, working dad. It is you, single. It is you, suffering Christian. It is you with your gift of hospitality. It is you with your gift of explanation. It is you with your gift of evangelism. It is you, Christian. You are the means of Christ's power making his own body grow to the glory God intends for it. You are the means. It is you, empty nester. It is you, middle-aged father. It is you, grandfather. It is you. You are the means that the God of the universe intends to bring glory to his son through the maturity of his body. It is you. Notice that Paul makes this explicit. Lest we miss why he's using the body metaphor it's, it's as though Paul says, I, I don't want you to miss I didn't randomly throw out body in, in, a, in a sort of general sense. I mean it quite specifically. Let me illustrate it. It's as though Paul says. He interrupts himself. The body makes the body grow is Paul's sentence. But he has this interruption, which happens to him all the time. He interrupts himself, and he says, let me, let me clarify why I'm using this. Let me use an illustration, he says, from the body. Notice down there. Notice. The whole body, interruption, paraphrase, joined and held. How does a body work? He breaks it down for them. How does a body work? It's joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. In other words, the body is all connected. It's connected one to another. It's not just this package of isolated parts. No, they, they play a part in each other. They, they, they connect to each other, and it is only healthy, notice he continues, when each part is working properly. So the, the body is not just an isolated gathering or even an identification. This is not a mystical body. This is not a body where I te technically I feel united in some general sense. No, this is an, an actually connected. The illustration is of, of ligaments and sinews in the body where life flows from one to another. And, and each part, Paul says, is intended to play a part in the health of the body. Such that, as he says in Corinthians, when, when one part doesn't do its job, all other parts suffer. So, Christian, you are as integrated a part in the cosmic mission of God to glorify his son in the salvation and glory of his church as a part of the body plays its small but significant part in the health of the body. Now, one Christian is not the whole body, but the whole body is made up of each part. And as anybody knows, even one part can cause excruciating pain and damage to the whole body. I've often, I've, I've thought about these times in life when, when you, you begin to age, and I, you anticipate this for yourself, certainly when you have uh, elderly grandparents or friends or relatives, when it, it, it reaches a point at times medically where it, no one part of the body can be depended on. Have you ever had to face that experience with a, a loved one? where they, they want to help this one part of the body with one medicine, but, but the liver can't really sustain the cost of that medicine, so you can't help the heart because the liver is weak, or you, or you can't help the lungs because the heart is weak. Have you ever had that experience? Well, well, that's the way God made the body to work. Everything contributes to everything else. There's only so much leaning on one part you can do to compensate for another part before that part starts to fail. Well, I, I think Paul knows that. That's why he says it's as each part is working properly. The liver can't decide to take a month off and ask the heart to fill in. There's a uniqueness. It's not like, boy, I, 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 you know, I'm just, can you kind of cover me? No, that, that never happens. That's why he uses the body metaphor, each part, each part must work properly. We're not all monolithic. We're not all the exact same parts, but each part has a unique part to play. I wanted to, to linger on that descriptive phrase. Once you understand the context, the body makes the body grow. It has this magnificent task of bringing glory to Jesus by causing his body to accurately reflect him. That's where he started in verse 1. I urge you as a prisoner for the Lord, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have received. You are called to be the body of Christ. 
There is no greater human glory on this earth or in history than to be called to play a small part in being the body of Christ, the head of all things, and the praise of creation. There is no greater ambition. There is no greater glory than to accurately reflect the glory of the Son of God. And you, Christian, are in this passage because you are a part that's supposed to be working properly. Remarkable gifting that God gave Paul to describe God's design for the church. God's design for each Christian. There is at the same time exaltation for a Christian here and humiliation. On the, at the same time, you are exalted because you are a part of God's great cosmic purpose and you are humbled because you are just a part. No Christian can claim to be the whole body and no Christian can claim that the body does not need him or her. The Christian, let me make this statement and you see if it reflects what's happening in this passage. The Christian is called to the spiritual growth of the church until it reaches its goal of bringing reflective glory to Jesus Christ. A Christian is called to the spiritual growth of the church. Let's make it very personal. You and I, you are called to the spiritual growth of the church. You are called to it by God himself. God has made you as much a central part of the body as a part of the body is to your body. If you could say to your liver or your heart or your whatever ligament or valve or whatever, you want to say, look, I, I, I don't think you're significant. Well, in the same way you could say to yourself, I don't have a role to play. Part of being a saint in the land, as David exclaimed, the excellent ones in whom is all my delight in the church, is to, to see the glory and the humility and the honor of, of this calling, the Christian. The Christian is called to play a part in the spiritual growth of the church. The Christian, you Christian are called. You are called. Yes, you Christian that is going through suffering right now, you are called. You Christian that is physically weak, you are called. You Christian facing financial uncertainty, you are called. You Christian that doesn't feel particularly articulate, you are called. You Christian that, that feels like your greatest days are behind you, you are called. You Christian, you are called to the building up of the church of Christ in love. You are called, you are called to only think of Christianity as this isolated following of God and worshiping him in this personal private matter is to fall short of our calling and to miss the grand design in which each part is working properly and makes the body build itself up in love. And remember the manner, the focus in this text is on speaking the truth in love. Are there other gifts that we use and that we serve? Absolutely. But the focus here is that the health of the body comes through speaking. Speaking the truth in love. The body makes the body grow as it does what? As it, as it speaks the truth, especially the truth about Christ in love, the Christ-centered truth of the scriptures as it is spoken in love, as it contradicts the lies and deceitful scheming of the culture and the lies and deceitful scheming of our own sin, the lies that we are tempted to believe about ourselves and about others, as it contradicts those things, what does it do? It builds up the church in love. So that Christians are called to be spokesmen for Christ to their fellow Christians and not only receivers. Crucial understanding. You see how the passage flows together. Are there pastors and teachers? Yes. What do they do? They equip the saints with the truth so that the saints can share the truth with one another. Pastors equip the saints with the truth so that the saints can share the truth with one another. So brothers and sisters, let me just make two significant applications. There's a lot of applications, but let me make two big ones. Two big ones for our church. Number one, how do we grow together on Sundays? How do we grow together on Sundays? How do we do that? How do we grow together on Sundays. 
Well, you have to first prioritize receiving the truth of God's word if you can fulfill the speaking of that truth, which you are called to do, into the ears of your brothers and sisters. Listen, if, if we haven't received and have a, a, a fresh input of the truth, we, we have very little we can give to others. Let me speak especially to any of us that have been Christians, I include myself in this, that for decades. So you've been Christian a long time. Maybe you got saved at a young age, or it's been decades, one way or another, since you've been saved. Let me encourage you. There is great danger in assuming that the old study is sufficient for the fresh encouragement. Isn't there a danger in that? You know, the old study, that book you read 20 years ago that you haven't picked up in all of those years, that Bible study you did, and, and, and you kind of pluck up those old studies. Now, I'm not against old studies, but old studies need to be renewed with fresh meditation and fresh studies, not of new truth, but of the same truth, freshly seen and freshly applied. Look, if, if you've been a Christian a long time, are there fresh studies of Jesus Christ and his gospel? Are you growing in your knowledge of the Son of God? When you come on Sunday, are you prioritizing? What, what can I learn? What have I not seen recently? How can I read and study? What, what, can I, what can I receive so that I can give? Look, when we come on Sundays, there should be this leaning in, knowing I'm called. I, I, I'm called to give. I'm called to speak the truth in love. When we come, let me encourage us, Sunday morning is the gathering where we hear the truth in love and where we look for moments to speak the truth in love to one another. It, it might happen at the, at the ministry, Mike. You might feel that God lays a particular scripture verse on your heart that is brief and can be given to the whole church. It might be that, a, a word of encouragement for the church, but it might even just be personally. Let, let me encourage you as a Christian and, and let me say this especially to young Christians, because frankly, our generation, myself, younger than me, especially if you're in your 20s right now, they, they tend to defy God by separating spirituality and church. And that is no less than the defiance of God's word. To attempt to separate spirituality from the body of Christ is defiance of God. God has united spirituality and the body of Christ. It is his design that it play together. And, and of course, the church is imperfect. That's why it needs to grow. And so many millennials and those younger, what do they tend to do? They tend to say, well, the church is imperfect. I'd rather just follow Christ. But, but no, you can't defy Christ and follow Christ at the same time. You can't malign the body of Christ and love the head. It doesn't make any sense to, to disparage the bride of Christ and to declare that you want to honor Christ. No, there, there is no place for that in the scriptures. And so anybody that is a younger Christian, let me urge you, prioritize Sunday meetings. I know this is a simple and straightforward application, but if we can't even prioritize the gathering of the church, then certainly we are not going to be able to speak the truth and love to one another. Prioritize. Limit Sunday morning exceptions. Let me put it that way. Limit them. I, I'm not saying you never have a vacation or you, you're never gone, you're never sick or something, but, but limit them. We all know there's those obvious exceptions and then there's the ones we take advantage of. Don't we all know those? That there's the obvious ones. Well, obviously, like, I, I was, you know, in the hospital. I can't be at church. I'm in the hospital. Okay, I get it. I, I was traveling to Zimbabwe to preach the gospel. And, okay, I, you know, we have our, our, you know, once a year we have a vacation or at some point we have, you know, we occasionally. There are certainly, I, I'm not trying to be firm legalistic in some sense if you don't make every sense. But, but we all know there is the other package of exceptions. It's a long week exceptions. It's fatigue on Sunday morning exceptions. It's, boy, it'd be nice to get away again exceptions. There's no rule book here, so Christians have to self-monitor. But Let's self-monitor by our calling and not by our culture. Let's self-monitor by our calling and not by our culture. Ask the question, is this exception in keeping with my calling to receive so that I can speak the truth? Brothers and sisters, this is, a, this is cosmic stuff. 
the glory of the Son of God kind of stuff. Let's, let's consider, am I limiting exceptions? Fathers, let me encourage you to take the, the spiritual leadership in this role. And wives, let me encourage you to make it easy for them to do so, to encourage. And maybe if it's, if it's dad that finds it easy to have an exception, wives, encourage and exhort your man to, to find his way to the place where the scriptures are taught. And when we come to church on Sundays, let us find our way to fellow Christians where we can encourage them with the truth of the gospel. One very simple way to do this is by singing loudly. This doesn't even require very personal activity. Singing loudly is one of the ways we communicate the truth of the gospel to one another. Actually, in Colossians, Paul says that the word of Christ dwells in us richly as we sing to one another. So let me just say this. Look, if, if you come to church on Sunday and you sing quietly, don't do that. Sing loudly. You're called to speak the truth in love. And there's got to be no easier time to do it than when the whole crowd is singing. Sing. Sing to me. I, I am refreshed as I hear your voices sing to one another. Sing about the glory of God and the gospel of Christ and the foundation the church has in the cornerstone. Sing and find your way to people in the church where you can speak the gospel to. Listen. We grow when we gather. We are not called to be isolated. Prioritize Sunday morning. Parents, prioritize it with your children. Start the process on Saturday night. Arrive with anticipation. Look, there's not very many greater gifts that a parent can give their child than to help them actually believe that Sunday is the best morning of the week. Grow together on Sundays. Secondly, grow together in community groups. Grow together. Grow together. Now, are there a thousand ways that that a Christian could personally fulfill the different organizations? Does it have to be Tuesday? Of course there are. But, But at some level, we have to kind of agree together as a church that there is this calling that goes beyond only attending on a Sunday. And brothers, can I just speak to this is a particular danger in our unique culture in the Bible Belt? This is, a, this, is a, this is a cultural danger that we need to call out. This is, this is schemes and, and dangers that we need to speak to in our own hearts. Look, listen, mere attendance is not a part working properly. It is good if it's done with faith and joy and eagerness and a humble, receptive heart, a desire to contribute. Yes, it is. But, but mere attendance cannot be seen to fulfill the calling that is described here. There has to be personal communication, personal encouragement, exhortation. Look, if, if, the, if the, the, the person, man or woman, is born again in Christ, that they are called to, to play their part within the body, not just by listening, but by speaking. And obviously, if you have a room full of 200 people, you can't all speak at the same time, like a penguin convention. You you can't do that. That's not possible. But but in the smaller groups, that is possible. But brothers and sisters, these, these community groups, what are they designed to do? They are designed to help us obey the Bible. Are there other ways you could organize it? Sure, of course. But but the goal is we don't want a disobedient body. We want to obey the Bible. We we want each part to have a place where they can work properly, where they can speak the truth in love. And so these these gatherings, what are they designed to do? To do that. Let, Let me encourage you. If you look back at the last year, let's take it a long stretch. Look at the last year. Is your part working properly in a small fellowship group setting? Are you speaking the truth in love? Are you encouraging? Are you building up? Are you, are you sharing the good news of Jesus? And listen, brothers, if you have nothing to share, sisters, if you have nothing to share, if you say, I got nothing to say, then it's time to start reading. It's time to start studying. If you have nothing to share, you're not reading enough. You're not studying enough. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be complicated, but something fresh to share. We are called. This is a glorious calling. Think about this. The lowliest Christian is called to speak the truth in love to help even the most ancient and reverent saint. Isn't that a glorious truth? 
there may be a place, if, if you're 18 and you're coming to a community group kind of study night for the first time, and there's someone there who's been a Christian as long as you've been alive, do you know it's possible for you to say something and strengthen their arms in the gospel? And, and if you have been a Christian for all those years, and this young person is coming in, and they're beset by the temptations of the culture, they feel like that wave that's tossed back and forth, and sometimes they talk like that. Do you realize you have a calling to speak the stability of gospel truth into their soul, to preserve them from the dangers of this culture in their own heart? Brothers and sisters, if we have not been prioritizing and emphasizing the one anothering of the gospel calling. Let's begin to do that. We're called to this. This is a glorious calling. Look, this will not end until Jesus comes back. I read a story this week that I was preparing for the message about a, a, a family that was in danger. They were, they were drifting in a riptide. And the mother was trying to save her children, but, but she eventually, by her own testimony, just, just passed out. She was trying to swim. She couldn't keep herself afloat. She couldn't reach them. And so the beachgoers linked arms, and they said it was something like 80 or 100 people linked arms out from the shore to hold on to them and to try to, to rescue them. The family was rescued. That is the church. That is the church. And, and all of us at different moments are vulnerable, need to be rescued. And, and yet, if, if one or two or five or ten begin to say, well, it's, it's been a long week and I'm, I'm tired and how much, I, I can't do everything. Well, of course not. But there is a part to play. There is a part to play. And it's as each part is working properly, that we reach each part in danger of those waves that toss us back and forth. Listen, Christian, if you think you're not in danger from the waves of this culture, you are deceived. I, I, I've been a Christian for 34 years. I am in danger from the waves of this culture. I was listening to a message this week, and I thought, yeah, I have not been doing that. I am vulnerable. That is a view of this culture that I am not paying attention to. I was receiving, and I was being guarded and protected. Listen, many glorious saints fade at the end of their race in Scripture. And so we never reach a point where we are sufficiently grounded by all of our past studies. We need fresh moments of receiving and of speaking to others. Brothers and sisters, each part is working properly. And when that happens, the body builds itself up in love. And don't you love that phrase, love? It happens at the beginning of the passage and the end. Love, because we love those for whom Christ died. We love those that he gave his life for. We love because he first loved us. Listen, that man, James Harrison, when he was saved on that operating table, the people who gave that blood, I don't think they gave their lives. They gave blood to help him. They serve, they sacrifice to help them. They didn't give their life. When we give to each other, we're not giving our lives. We're giving and receiving and giving and receiving. There's the ongoing transfusion of truth that should be taking place continually in the church of God. And when someone misses their place, they should be missed. And yet, all of this flows from someone who did not just give and serve a portion, but gave and sacrificed his life to bring to himself people for God from every tribe and nation. Listen, he gave his life to create this body. He gave his life to create each part of this body. Jesus died so that you could be a part of the body of Christ, the saved, sanctified, and ultimately glorified body, reconciled to God. 
He died not just to bring you out, but to put you in. He died not just to rescue you from, to bring you to. He died not just to set you free, but to connect you in. He died to connect you to his own body with the goal of glorifying him as each part does its work. Christians, we have a calling to unite ourselves to each other because we are all united to the life-giving Son of God and to in him help each other grow until he returns. Sins forgiven. Penalty paid. Church connection established. Each part doing its work in grateful, affectionate praise of the Son of God who made it all possible. The body of Christ through Christ and from Christ makes his body grow so that it builds itself up in the love that it first received from him, the dying and resurrected one. In him, let us build this body up in love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the privilege of being a part of your body. Lord, there is no place more honored to be than united to you and therefore united to your church. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage and the grace and the strength to build up this particular body in love. Lord, I pray that you would guard us from the idea of this culture that we can divorce spirituality from from church care and from fellow one anothering. Lord, help us, protect us from that wave of doctrine. Lord, may we say honestly and genuinely with David, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. May we say that, Lord, of those that we are with community group in, come and see on Sunday morning, may may we exult that here is one for whom you died. And may we be as conscientious towards their well-being as we would be if you were standing there watching them. Give us grace, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.